So good afternoon. It's a pleasure for me to be with you today. Um, young students, old students, all people putting in the effort, paying tuition to be here to come and learn. Um, it's sometimes a sacrifice. It's a lot of work. Thank you for doing that. Really what I want to do today is share with you my journey, uh, where I've come from, where am I at right now. Jen just said that um, in the introduction that I am a software engineer, and that's true. I started becoming a software engineer earlier in my life when it wasn't cool, when people who were nerds were kind of shunned and not liked very much, and so it's kind of turned around. It's been refreshing. Uh, I also own a business. I am a property manager with my wife. We've been doing it for 15 years, and we'll talk about the story of how that started. So I feel like I'm a normal person, but according to Jen, I'm pretty successful. And there's a couple of things that she asked me to talk about to describe how I possibly could have become that, how I was lucky enough to become successful. So let me just start out by saying that I grew up in Midvale, Utah. Midvale, Utah is right in the center of the valley. There's a lot of general people there. Um, my parents were normal folk. My dad was a school teacher. He worked nine months out of the year for many years, but never got out of the fifth grade. He was always in the fifth grade because that's what he taught. He didn't have a lot of money, and we had a large family. We had four kids to take care of and meet all of their needs. So when I was 12 and 13, I had a friend in the area. His name was Dewey, who owned a business. He was an entrepreneur and his job was doing upholstery. Nothing glamorous, nothing overly exciting, but he would take something old and make it new again. And I thought that was really interesting, and so I said, yeah, I'll, I'll come work with you. So Dewey also had some financial needs that he was meeting, and so he would come pick me up on Saturday afternoons, and we would go in his truck and do upholstery work for half a day on Saturdays. And that's how I started working. Um, I learned from Dewey that it was important to work, even though you could be doing something else. It was Saturday and he was out working. He taught me to work hard, he wanted me to work hard, and I was happy to get the money for doing that. With that money, I could buy things that my parents couldn't afford to get me. I got new shoes, I got food, I got clothes. Um, how many of you like to go to dates or go to dances? Raise your hand. So whenever there was a new dance, I would get a new shirt and wear that, and that was kind of fun. And all those things came from working. The other thing that helped me when I was young was that I had a grandmother on my price side who always sat us down. We'd, we'd go visit her. She'd sit us down, give us cookies and punch. And when we'd talk with my grandma Price, she'd always ask us how school was going. And if, by chance, we had good grades, Grandma Price would be very excited. She would just say, that's neat. So it was really kind of cool to make grandma happy. So that was my start. That was, that was showing me how to work and how um, to get ahead. I was motivated because at the time, we didn't have the chance to sit down and do Facebook, Snapchat, video games, Apple, FaceTime, you name it. We had bicycles at the time. They were invented. We had wagons and we had other things that we could do. TV was there. It was in black and white at first, so I got to see that transition. And so I, I was motivated to do different things. My family wasn't going to give me my start in life that was going to propel me to success. Um, I, wasn't, I didn't have a lot, so I needed to get out and do the work for myself. Uh, I had a dream, and everybody has a dream, right? But my dream wasn't crazy glamorous. My dream was I want to be able to afford a house and I want to have a family. That's it. Get a house, get a family. And to do that, I realized that I needed to go to college. And that just seemed so far off when I was young. Um, I ended up going to the University of Utah eventually for four years and picked up a degree in computer science. Later in life, I went to uh, this university, this college, um, Salt Lake Community College and studied renewable energy for two semesters. So I kind of feel like we have something in common for that. Well, when we were young, my parents wouldn't get very much, but one thing they did get, they bought this radio. There was a small radio back in the day, which today they're awfully small, but back in the day they were the size of about a, a butter 
uh, box where you have the four cubes, and it had AM and FM. And the marketing tag that sold a lot of these radios was the fact that it was a nine transistor radio. Nine transistors. And so when I was young, I looked at the radio and I said, well, I, I want to go in and count those transistors. It says it's nine, I got to count it. So I opened it up without permission and started counting transistors. To my chagrin, I only found seven transistors and I thought I had been sold a lie. But I'm sure there was, I'm sure there was nine transistors. But my dad didn't like that I was opening up the radio and doing things, and he was always a little worried about my curiosity and doing things like that. So when I was 18 and graduating from school, just before I graduated, I was taking a computer class in high school. And I sat down and I started doing my homework. I thought, hey, this is pretty cool. I can make drawings on my screen. I can tell the computer what to do. And it can do it so fast that it would do it much better than I could. And so I ended up getting an A out of that computer class, and after graduation went out and bought an old Apple computer that was used. However, again, my parents were worried, they were really worried that I was spending my money for college on this computer. It was $600 at the time, and they said, you'll never get that money back. So I used it, I did word processing for college on it, and this was in the late 80s, when this was not something that you would just go over to your friend's house and do. And that computer served me really well. It turns out that uh, I was leaving to go to Spain on a mission, and I needed the money to get ready. And I put the computer up for sale, and I got an inquiry from Jen Klink's dad, who was looking for a computer, and he offered me the same amount that I had spent to buy the computer. So I didn't lose anything and I got all that computer experience, which was a great, great thing for me. So that's how I got started in the technology field. Um, I really think that technology at the time I was going to school was not cool. It was not something that a lot of kids wanted to do because it was computer science. Yet at the same time, it had this allure. You could start seeing lots of changes coming. This is pre-internet. This was late 80s and we had terminals that were black and white, we had email, we didn't have a lot of fancy things, we, didn't, we certainly didn't have apps as you know them today, but it was great and I really enjoyed working on it. Um, Jen asked me to talk a little bit about one of the most um, important things, one of the biggest success stories of my life, and it started me thinking, and the one thing that I could think of that was the greatest success story was while I was going to school in computer science and learning all these things, I met my wife and needed to have a good job to pay for having a family, so I started applying. The biggest single success for me was getting my foot in the door in a computer company. That way I was able to get some experience so that when I graduated, I already had experience and I could get a high paying job. So by getting an opportunity to get your foot in the door, you will also find ways to build upon that and be successful. I could probably say that it was luck, and it was probably 50% luck, but there was also an element of being prepared. Because you see, the people who were hiring interns at the time, they were looking for somebody who had some good grades. They were looking for somebody who they thought was going to be a good employee. And I believe at the time my grades were 3.8, 3.9. I hadn't let them drop by dating my wife too much by that time. So they were still pretty good. So I believe that's one of the things that leads to success is getting your foot in the door. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the life lessons that I've learned by going to school and becoming a programmer and those types of things. And I'd like to refer you to the reading sheet that I put out there. By the way, these are books that have influenced my life, and I just threw them together. Um, we have The Richest Man in Babylon by George S. Clayson, The Millionaire Next Door by Thomas Stanley and William Danko, How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie, Rich Dad, Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki, and finally Good to Great by Jim Collins. I'd like to have you refer to The Millionaire Next Door. 
he has a quote in here that's very important that I think sums up a lot of the um, success that I've had. It said here that more than 80% of millionaires are ordinary people who have accumulated wealth in one generation. They did it slowly, steadily, without signing a multi-million dollar contract with the Yankees, without winning the lottery. You guys got that? Slowly, steadily, without signing a multi-million dollar contract, without becoming the next, next Mick Jagger, windfalls make good, great headlines, but such occurrences are rare. So basically that's the secret, is taking advantage of the opportunities that come up one at a time. Jen also asked me to talk a little bit about the failures that I had, and when I read that I thought, oh gosh, I'm supposed to be talking about successes. Do I have to include these failures? And then I thought for a minute, you know, maybe these failures defined me in some way. Maybe there was something that I learned, and I actually did. So along the way to becoming, um, after I was a computer programmer, I started trying to become uh, involved in business and real estate and owning some properties that I could rent. Today, the properties that we own rent between $900 and $1,400. How many of you guys pay rent right now? Yeah, how would you like to be getting those rents you're paying your landlord? Not a bad deal, right? Right on. So that's why I wanted to get into it. Um, but along the way to doing that, I had one of the failures occur in my life. We bought a property that we thought we'd like, but yet it didn't turn out to be what we thought it was. And when we sold that property a year later, we lost $25,000. $25,000, that's a lot of money, right? So one of the things I learned from that is when you're going out on your own, get somebody to sign or get somebody to verify what you're doing before you sign, sleep on it, get multiple opinions. So my father-in-law and mother-in-law needed a house and my wife and I were able to help them get into a house. We helped with their down payment. Um, this was the very first property we bought the down payment was pretty substantial. We had to borrow to get it. And unfortunately, my father-in-law died two years later. But we were happy because he actually had a house that he could live in and call his own here. Um, when they died, when he died, they wanted to sell the house. So we said, hey, we'll just take that house. We'll take that mortgage that we helped get. We'll just make it happen. But then at the same time, we realized they had had a child in need and they had taken out a $20,000 second mortgage on that house. So we couldn't just take it and get it and start renting it. We had to come up with even more money to be able to make that deal happen. So one of the life lessons that I have in here that you'll find is that sometimes things are a little harder than you expect. In fact, probably most of the time, right? Things are a little harder than you expect them to be. When we bought that first property, we had to put in a little extra money to make that deal work. So let me circle back again to when I was 14. Remember that upholsterer I worked for? His name was Dewey. Dewey also had real estate. Dewey was an entrepreneur in uh, the work he did for upholstery, but also in owning homes and things like that. And so I saw Dewey at an event, just saying hi. And I said, hey Dewey, do you still own those duplexes? And he's like, yeah, do you want to buy them? And I'm like, oh, maybe. <laughs> kind of floored me. Uh, and it turns out that I wasn't in a position to be able to buy both of them. I mean, I could refinance my car, I could refinance my home, get a second mortgage, and pick up that second property on our path to owning multiple properties. And it turns out that uh, he said, tell you what, you buy that first one the normal way through the bank, I'll just sell you the other one just as myself being the bank. You just make payments to me. Which is totally amazing and that's one of the things that Robert Kawasaki says in his book and I'd refer you back to the list at the near the bottom where it says, be careful when you take on debt. If you take on debt personally, make sure it's small. If you take on large debt, make sure someone else is paying for it. You guys get that? Okay, make sure somebody else is paying for that debt. Basically, somebody else is paying for the rent which pays the mortgage on that place that we bought. So now, with Dewey's help, 
we were able to refinance our car, pick up a second mortgage, but we have two more properties, so now we have three properties that, we're, uh, that we own that we're renting. So with a little bit of luck, we found another property close by that looked attractive, and by that time, homes had appreciated and we were able to pull out some equity and just use our savings and buy a fourth property. And now we had a portfolio of a million dollars worth of rentals that we were renting at the time. Um, sounds good, right? Robert Kawasaki would be very proud. Rich Dad, Poor Dad was all about a boy whose poor dad wasn't doing a lot of investing, but yet the rich dad was. And so Robert suggests going out and getting property after property after property. However, I want to make one clarification to the, work, to the book that he wrote that he didn't say. And that is with each property, the workload goes up. So as you are thinking about doing something in business and thinking about, well, I want to scale up, right? Be prepared to work extra hard, um, especially as you're growing. At a certain place in time, it's going to get easier. Uh, with our business, the rental units took me, you know, doing all the repairs, all the cleanings and things like that. It took a lot of my time. But now, if there's a problem, I call somebody. If there's a plumbing problem, I call somebody. If there's a problem with, I don't know, the electrical, I call somebody. And so I don't have to do that work, but yet I still get to receive the income from all those properties. It is quite a bit of work, but I think it's manageable where we're at. I wanted to talk about another failure that I had. Um, I always wanted to do something fun. I, I like computer science and it's fun, but I wanted to do something that I felt was reflected of me. And that was being in renewable energy. Uh, solar panels, windmills, that type of stuff. I mean, I wanted to help the earth, right? We want to feel good, all of us do. And so I started a renewable energy company and came to this college and took classes and became certified in doing solar panel work. And I thought, well, gosh, now I'm certified, what do I do? Well, I had this dream of doing a big project. And so I looked around, and at the time, the government was giving some incentives for counties and governments to put in electrical solar panels. And so I applied for one of the grants. And guess what, guys? I got a $125,000 grant. I got it. So we started working with the city, but the city didn't feel comfortable without going through a process of bidding, which they do for all their work. And so the city, Franklin City up in Idaho, said, we want to put this out to bid. Um, I was standing to make forty dollars or $50,000 because the price of solar panels were dropping at the same time. It was great. And they put it out to bid. And unfortunately, one of the owners of a large renewable energy company lived in that area and saw that in the paper. And so he came in and outbid me. So even though I had won the contract, I had got the, the money for the city, um, he outbid me, and so the city went with him. So I felt really bad. To me, that was a failure. I didn't do something right to be able to finish that deal. And I felt like that would have been a great launch, right? With $30,000, $40,000, I could have started doing a lot more work. But at the same time, I thought to myself, you know, I just need to keep trying and trying, but I didn't have the time. I have my day job, I have my other business. And so I think if I would have had a little more time and kept trying, I probably could have done another thing like that and actually won. So what I learned from that is you've got to keep trying and you'll make it. Another thing I did was uh, when computer jobs started going away, there was um, a time in about 2005 when computer jobs were transferring to China. And I didn't want my job to go to China, so I thought, well, what else can I do? Uh, what else do I like to do? I like to do pharmacy type of things. I like to help people. I'm bilingual. I can speak Spanish and help them. So I'll try pharmacy. So I went back to school and took pre-med classes and applied for school, applied for pharmacy school. I received a 97 on the PCAT, which is the exam to get into pharmacy school. And in that particular time, I thought, I'm in. I'm definitely in. But I applied, and I didn't get in. And I felt really bad, because I had just failed again. I was like, what's going on? And it turns out that I had only applied to one school. I hadn't applied to many schools. And so I had my focus way too small. 
So as you guys apply to different schools and want to do different things, make sure you ap apply to lots of schools. Spread your wings out. You guys will have a lot of opportunities. Um, don't limit yourself to just one school. And that's what I learned in that case. Uh, what other big successes have I had? I wanted to talk just a minute about being lucky. Um, I think that I have been really lucky at love. I know, don't laugh, I have been really lucky at love. Last year, my wife and I celebrated our 25th anniversary of being married, and we got to go to Venice and take a gondola ride, go to Rome, go to see Vesuvius, go to see the Leaning Tower of Pisa for a couple weeks. And I've just been really lucky to have somebody like that in my life. And I think that luck has spilled over to some of the business work that I do uh, and, the, and the work in the technology field. I couldn't have expected anything better than in 2005 for when computer jobs were starting to go to China for Apple to start bringing out the iPhone and the smartphone. Now all of these computer guys who had been wondering whether their job's gonna stay or not were being picked up to write apps. It was great, it was awesome. Uh, it's just amazing all the things that happen. And then Android comes right after that. How many of you have an Android or Apple device? Raise your hand. Pretty much everybody. And so all those apps needed to be written by somebody. And all those operating systems needed to be written and, and developed. And that has made my career just grow and grow and grow. A couple of years ago, where I work, we wrote an application for Android that would help track people's work. Um, for example, if there was somebody within your company who was taking secrets out and that type of thing, we could catch that and report that. So my career has just been going crazy because of all those types of things. Now, it wouldn't be fair if we just talked about all the things that I have done. Um, Jen asked me to talk about what five nuggets of information I would give to a younger me, um, probably many of you in this room. And so I put, to, I put them down, and here they are. I put down here, and this is coming from a computer guy, okay? Computer guys, it's sometimes hard to have people skills, okay? So I put on here, people skills are important. Open yourself up. Put yourself out there, even if you don't think you'll be that interesting. It's kind of funny how we don't think we're interesting, but yet somebody else does. We don't think that we have talents, but yet somebody else is watching us and says, I wish I could do that like that person. So that's one of the things. Number two, let people know how great they are. How many times do people tell you how great you guys really are? You're here, you're spending your money, you're sacrificing to come and better your education. You guys are great. I think that's awesome. Keep doing it. Number three, value yourself as much as you value others. Sometimes it's easy to think that somebody else is doing something better than you. It's just that way. But value yourself. Remember that. Remember when you're asked to do something that uh, your time is also valuable and balance it out. As I mentioned earlier, with buying that first property that it was a little harder than what we had expected because a family member had taken out a loan. Remember that everything you do in life, practically everything, will take a little bit longer, and that's okay. You just plan on it. If you have a project for your apartment or a project for your home or a project for your class, remember it's gonna take just a little bit longer, and that's okay. The last thing that I have here for a little nugget to share is that live in the moment. Live at this time, because your life is what's happening right now. This is the best time. Your memories are fresh. You guys are young. You guys have a lot going for you right now. Enjoy it, live in the moment. Sacrifice and build, and later you'll be very happy. You'll be able to do different things, kind of like we've been able to do with our businesses. Right, how did I start working for a missile company, right? So here's how that happened. I started working uh, as an intern and got my foot in the door when I was still in college. That job, two years later, turned into a full-time job and they started paying me a full-time salary. With that salary, I was able to buy the house of my dreams. Um, it wasn't a lot, but I still bought a house. However, I started having more bills and more bills come. So I left that company and got a 10% raise to go to another company. 
And they were looking for somebody with my skills, and I worked there for four or five years. And then I had more bills with this first rental property I told you guys about, right? And I left that company and went to another company and got a 10% raise. So working for that company, I stayed there for four or five years doing software for Windows um, and things. And then the Chinese situation, taking jobs came and I left and I started going back to school for pharmacy. But I finished the, the pharmacy work and guess what? Taking pre-med helped me get a better computer job. I started working for, as a contractor for a medical company that was writing software to track people doing uh, making objects move just by thinking. It was for people who had lost nerves and had nerve damage. And then from there, I had a friend talk to me who was being successful, and I went from there and got a 10% raise to go work for another company and worked for them for a long time. Then that company was bought by another company, and when they got bought, I had stock options, and they gave money to me just for free, just because I owned part of that company, and I worked for them. Well, that company started doing kind of iffy, and I saw the boat kind of being shaky, so I talked to a friend of mine, and I said, hey, you know, do you have a job? And he's like, yeah, come over here. So I go over there, and they gave me a 10% raise to work for this company, Raytheon, which makes missiles. And then they, two years ago, spun out their company called Forcepoint, which does security software. Unfortunately, I didn't get that 10% raise. They just spread us apart. So, um, and that's okay, that's okay. But that's how I got to work for that company. But you see, there's kind of this, I would say it's, you know, putting that foot in the door was just getting me on the escalator. And then I just kind of been on the escalator, right? So do what you can to get your foot in the door. You may not get paid for your internship, but you'll learn a lot and you might be able to get a job at the end of it. Good question. How many degrees do I have is the question. Right now, I just have my bachelor's degree. Uh, I don't have a master's, I don't have a PhD, although I wish I would have a master's because it could help in, in some certain situations. But um, I think that it's important to get some degree in your life because then you have something to fall back on. And the reason I say that is if you look at the statistics, who knows what the unemployment rate in Utah is right now? Who can tell me? 4%, 3%, something like that, 4.5% maybe. So if you look at the statistics, that's an aggregation of the people who have a degree, a, an advanced degree, people who have no degree, and people who haven't graduated from college. If you look at how the jobs vary, we always worry, oh gosh, with a 4% unemployment rate, I'm gonna be in trouble. If, you know, that's maybe once or twice in my life I'm not gonna have work. Well, if you look at it, that's just the average. If you don't have a degree, the unemployment rate is something like 15%. Um, but once you get a degree, the unemployment rate is something like 2%. See, it's a big difference. And so I encourage you to get a degree. If you have an advanced degree, it's something like 1%. I mean, that, that's, just, that's just crazy. So get a degree. The other thing I would encourage you to do is, and I encourage my boys, I have a 25-year-old and a 23-year-old. One's going to BYU and one's going to UVU. The one at BYU is going to go into psychology and the one at UVU is going into computer science, despite how much I've been able to try to talk him out of it. Um, but uh, I encourage them to think about starting a business, starting a business that serves people. Um, in the book, The Millionaire Next Door, it talks about careers that you could choose to do well financially, and one of those is being uh, like an accountant, another one is a lawyer, things that serve the people who have the funds, those are good things to do. So as far as degrees, I have the one. So the question was, I took some classes for pre-med, do I have a degree in that? The truth is I took the pre-med classes and then you apply to go into a program, and if they accept you, you can start getting the degree. Uh, I took organic chemistry, I took tons of classes. I should get a degree, I'd think, from it, but I didn't. I was probably more of an associate's type of thing or a certificate. Um, and coming here and learning solar gave me a certificate. It wasn't a degree. So sometimes if you get the certificate, it's enough to help you. Um, in my line of work right now, if you have a cybersecurity certificate, that helps you um, immensely. Yeah, sure. 
So just like anybody who has never been into anything, I just jumped in. I had no idea what I was getting into. The question was, can I talk about the risk management, those types of things that you, know, you have happening when you jump in? So my, my, my comment is, I didn't know what I was getting into. I thought I was just gonna own a property and then I was gonna collect a rent and I was gonna go to the bank and then I was gonna do that over and over until the property was paid off. However, that's not how it works, folks. Um, we know that there's problems. We know that sinks break, you know, bathrooms break, electrical things happen, people leave, you have to clean the place. And as it turns out, it was, it was quite a bit of work. Um, it was a big risk because I didn't have a lot of time to do that because I have a day job. And my wife was kind of skeptical saying, is this really gonna work because uh, when am I gonna see you? And it was hard because I had to invest and sacrifice and do all the work myself at first. And plus, taking on that much debt and assuming that I'm going to be able to pay it back. I mean, the house was $130,000, $140,000 at the time. Um, I was a really good red-blooded American and a lot of debt at the time. So, yeah, there's a lot of risk. The, th the other thing I would say is, had that not worked very well, had I had a really bad experience, I may have just said, no, this isn't for me, I'm not gonna do it. But I found that if I spend some of my free time taking care of the rentals and things, then I can enjoy that income that comes in. Um, and then in a few years, I may be able to retire and have that as something that'll help me retire. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me, Jen. I had a good time. This is great, great class, thank you.